Hello and welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Today's show, a little bit later, I'm going to have on Haumea Hanakahi. And she is a very gifted healer. She helps sensitive mystics, other healers, and empaths. And we're going to be talking about magical soul-led sensitives and trauma. Do you identify? then you're in the right place. Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger won the COVR award for best radio and podcast show. Welp magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top best 20 podcasts to listen to this year. It's a high ranking self-improvement show on Apple Podcasts and it was nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world and you can become a facilitator or go to one of their classes. Go to drdanehere.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a book writing coach and I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling book status. And I'm also a boutique publicist. I represent about six different spiritual messengers who do great work out into the world, and I get them booked on radio and podcast. And if you are a spiritual messenger, would you like also to get booked? This is your time, right? You came here to shine your light and to have a voice and be visible. I am about to offer a free webinar. Only thing is you must register to get the Zoom link. And if you're ready to become a sought after expert in your industry, then imagine getting hired more often, being invited to speak at paid events, having the opportunity to be interviewed on your favorite podcasts. Picture your calendar brimming with new clients and your books, your services, your workshops are selling like hotcakes as your community discovers you through engaging podcast interviews. Well, these accomplishments are not just dreams for my clients. They are achievable realities and they can be for you too. I am thrilled to invite you to my upcoming Zoom webinar event, Visibility Masterclass, Be Your Own Publicist. Again, you must register in order to get the link and the date. And I will have this in the show notes for now. It is for those listening on podcasts. It's myvisibility.site slash registration. Again, that is myvisibility.site slash registration. And with such great honor, I introduce you to my guest today, Haumea Hanakahi. She, she's known as the sacred dragon oracle. She's a highly gifted psychic mystic, intuitive wisdom guide, zapper of energy blocks and storyteller. She is the secret healer of healers and movement leaders for extraordinary removal of energy blocks. If you are a highly sensitive person, empath or mystic, Haumea offers understanding insights, tools, and clearings to assist in boldly expressing and living your unique divine design a cauldron of neurosciences, biomechanics, metaphysics, herbals, and understanding that everything is energy allows Haumea to facilitate alchemical transformations. She lends her wisdom into the topics of fear, trauma, and healing. She's been on her own healing journey for over 30 years. Haumea's message is to be more of your magical, unique, and divine self. Most people who work with Haumea just have this sense or feeling to do so. That's exactly why she's here today. I saw her featured, I think it was on the Shift Network or Transformational Paradigm, something. I just saw her picture and I didn't even go to the webinar. I'm like, I don't know who this woman is, but I have to meet her. So here she is for all of us today. She has got a mission to serve conscious evolution on earth. Haumea is lighting a torch for a legion of soul-led sensitives and mystics who are liberating themselves and others from artificial limits placed upon humanity. If you would like to learn more, you can go to her website, which is sacredharmony.com slash welcome. And with that, I do welcome to the Dare to Dream show, the beautiful Haumea. It is so nice to have you here today. Debbie, thank you. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Really appreciate being here. 
being with your, your audience here. That bio alone, <laughs> so many questions. So I'm going to allow those to percolate because I there's one out there that I really want to ask you about. But I want to start here about your passion, evolving consciousness on earth at a very important time and helping to make the invisible visible. I find that fascinating because in my work, I help people with visibility, but clearly very different, but very important pieces. So that others can understand you better and your gifts. What is it like for you to see things that others can't see? And what or whom is visible to you? Who do you work with? Well, great question. Um, I, I work with a lot of different teams that come together um, from the divine realms and they assist in the different classes and sessions that I have. Um, some of them I perceive as dragons, angels, mer people, elementals, um, the earth, um, spirits of different things. Like today, on today's master class, I did um, the spirit of ascension came in for the first time, mm -hmm. and that was really exciting to have that spirit and a message from that spirit to come in. Um, so. I don't always see them. Sometimes I do. I go in and out of different ways that I perceive. So my strongest one is a sense of gnosis or knowing just, and, um, and then also viscerally, I feel things, I experience things. And then I'll also hear sometimes and see. So it's a combination of those things. And um, I feel like I came in always being connected with them. And I think that there, there are so many that are around us all the time. It's just a matter of awareness and then also cleaning our own field and, and being able to connect. I do it with a very high level of discernment. So mm -hmm. all of those that work with me and that I work with are very, very highly vetted um, so that I'm not getting voices in that are tricksters, things like that. Yeah. Yes. I love what you just said so much. And it just, where I'm going with this is twofold. So the first thing is, is it the same all the time? So the same dragons, the same mer people, the same Pachamama earth, the same angels, or do different ones show up and that's where the discernment comes in? I have, um, there's different ones that come in. There's there's like pretty much some steady teams and steady beings that are always um, one of their jobs is to uh, be guardians of what's happening in the sacred container um, and who is allowed in and who's not. But then there's also appropriateness. So it's I call in those that are appropriate for whatever I'm doing at the time. If it's a class, if it's a one on one session, it's not only my teams, but the um, the person I'm working with, their their soul and their team and their soul is directing it. So then it becomes like a conference call. So it's often ah. like that. It's a conference call for the topic at hand. Mm. You must have had a good time today, with me. We had a session together and you said, <laughs> oh, there are 20 teams here. And I'm not sure all of who showed up in these various categories you're talking about, but that must have been a lot of cacophony happening to pay attention to. <laughs> there was, um, there's a lot there. Thank goodness for me. They organize themselves and then um, I get like a unified or a, you know, a dominant voice or presence that comes forth and communicates um, for, for the group, or there's different ones that come in at different times as the dominant um, presence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's order. There's order going on. And there's definitely order. If it was just a cacophony, I would go nuts with that. Um, but they're very beloved to me. I just, I adore them. I love them. And I'm so grateful for them. And um, they on their part, they are so grateful for us because we're the boots on the ground. We're the ones that are in bodies. And even though so many of us have gone through our lives with a lot of struggle and thinking, why am I here? And I just want to go home. I don't want to be here. 
there are so many beings that are lined up to come to earth school. And then there are so many, especially during these times now that are available to assist us and love it when there's somebody that's boots on the ground, that's, that's willing to work with them. So I call it a co-creation. We're co-creating together. And what about discernment? I guess what I'm curious about, so that's in a more ethereal realm, but Mm -hmm. if somebody says, oh, I had a past life with this person and, you know, it's definitely, I know it's real because of the feeling I have of a strong feeling of connection or I have a strong or a great, you know, like or lust or whatever it may be with this individual. I'm just giving you one example, but in my mind, I always think, well, I trust myself. That's all I could say. I trust myself to suss out. Like I always have a knowing about it. This is light and good, or this is, mm, I feel that no, 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 um, very strongly. I know not everybody does. And I know everybody has really the best intentions for that them in their lives. How do they know truly is this a dark force, something that's entangling and creating cords and maybe not the best health in the best situation, or this truly is because they feel that way about this individual, a good situation? Yeah, I, that's such a great question and so pertinent, especially if so many people are waking up and having interest in, in spirituality and the arts and Um, And just what else is there in life and wanting to connect. I would say the most important thing is that it's always endued with an energy of love, of loving presence. So if you're getting, I mean, so I'll give an example. When I was growing up, I had a lot of my, um, my guides. Now I don't call them guides. Now there are, there are teams that work with me. But I did have some really hardcore grandmothers and the etheric and and others that I felt like I was constantly getting whacked by them. Um, But it was it was lovingly and it was very disciplinary, but it was never scary. So if you're receiving something that feels scary in your nervous system, um, and I'm not talking about, well, you, you know, there's something coming up, a change in life, and that's making you nervous about a change in life. It's like, a fear response, that's, that's not all right. There's so many that are sneaking through and there, I'd say there are technologies also that are putting voices in people's heads that they tend to give a little bit of truth and that snares people. It's like, well, I can recognize that sense of truth. So the rest must be true too. And it's not, it's like, it has to be consistently with a loving energy of pureness and a loving energy. And one of the biggest ways that I help people to to discern is moving, helping them to move, I give them tools to move their their energy from their heads to their hearts. Because what's happening right now, our world has been very, very mental um, for a couple thousand years, many hundreds of years now. And so, and with, artificial intelligence with computers, all that stuff, we're in our head a lot. That is the place that is the most easily manipulated. So there can be technologies and thoughts and other beings that are not so beneficial that are able to access us through that mental body. If we move, when we move our energy into our heart, our heart is the biggest, the most, um, I'd say is the best filter that we have. It's it's our own spiritual high tech that overrides other techs. And so when we move, for instance, if we move our thoughts from our head to our hearts, then the heart can filter that information. It filters out what's true for me, what's not true for me, what resonates, what doesn't resonate. And that's very different than the influences we get strictly on the mental level. So that's one of the biggest things is really being in our heart and in our body, really being embodied, going even further down into our body, into our belly, into our womb space and feeling the visceral responses we're having because our body is a great informer for us. Yes, 100%. I I so understand that. And I like that idea 
of the heart being the gatekeeper, the, the place within us we can trust that it truly getting out of the head, out yeah. of the mental, because it's it's just facts and uh, facts aren't real, right? They're just information, like you said, that could be disseminating with some truth and enough to be alluring. And then the rest of it is ensnaring. And so in your work, mm -hmm. Haumea, I know this is like a quote from you. You say, my dragon teams and the elementals are eager to clear the dross from their beloved magical friends wearing human skin suits. The holy warriorship has risen and the sword of truth will have its way. Your soul sovereignty matters. First of all, you have such a way with words. I love how you express yourself on your website and in your copy and all that. It's beautiful. And then the question is, so what are the dragons, whom I'm in love with, what do the dragons and the elementals have to say to us about clearing the dross and using the sword of truth? Mm, great question. Well, let me put it to them. Um, so the dragons want to take this one. And I want to say a little bit about dragons is that Dragons are, they used to be in contact with humans. And then there was, there was a time period where they got manipulated, they got enslaved. Um, there were some that turned to uh, a non-beneficial side. The dragons that I work with, they come from very, very high dimensions and dra dragons in general, they are a very, very intelligent species. And what they have told me is that they have, they're coming back now and interacting more with humans now out of a decision that they've made because they have watched our evolution. And so they're wanting to assist us now in our evolution. And they feel like, okay, this is the time and we're willing to do it now. So we're seeing, I, I mean, it's amazing seeing the dragon consciousness just you know, blossom right now. Um, and so many people just feeling, oh, dragons. Yes. So the, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of very beneficial ones and it's always good to ask. <laughs> um, and so their message um, about clearing that dross is that we humans have been under influences that many of them artificial, um, so for instance, artificial um, influences may have been spells, curses, black magic. It could be devices, technologies, and other things that have influenced us and our operating system so greatly that we have been we have been limited in our ability to access our true divine selves and operate from that place. And so we have all these, and a lot of it shows up in the form of traumas or, or um, trauma states, addictions, um, default patterns, things handed down from lineal um, genetic familial lines that are, um, they are altered in ways that uh, limit us as divine beings. And so that's the draw, that's largely the dross that's being removed now, all these artificial things. And then there's also plain old drama, um, traumas, excuse me. I mean, because we do, we do experience a lot of different things. And then the way I express traumas is as stuck energy. So it's stuck energy in the body. I don't really go into all the stories behind it. It's basically stuck energy that just, when it gets to move or evolve or resolve, then we have access to our higher self, our true essence, our divine design. And they and the dragons and elementals, they, they want us to have access to that because we're super beings and we're not, many of us are not, most of us have not been accessing our superpowers. And so, and I'll also say, so why, why are these things put in place over many eons? There are, um, there are some that have been jealous of each other. And so, you know, coveting other people's gifts. And then there are some beings that don't have 
the type of access we have as souls and that divine creator energy that is within us. And so there's been a lot of effort to dumb us down and to block that access because we really are super beings. And I'll add with the with the solar flares going on right now, a lot of the photonic energy, those are very activating to our DNA and to our to to our spiritual bodies. And so there's also there's knowledge of that. And there are efforts to block that awakening of, of these gifts that we do have. Wow. So based on your answer, I would assume that here we are in the middle of ascension. People are absolutely feeling it emotionally, definitely physically on so many levels. They're experiencing what feels uncomfortable and strange to them at times. And it I'm assuming by the way you describe that, that means that there's traumas popping right now for many people during Ascension. Is that correct? Well, especially during the last few years, we've mm -hmm. all been heavily trauma traumatized globally where these medical conditions, you know, so-called medical conditions and so-called treatments have been forced upon us. And, um, you know, the, there's so much I could say about that, but yes, we've experienced a lot of traumas just from that. And then the programming that's, that's going on, the, the narratives that are happening that are very divisive. And also there's just a whole lot of manufactured stories out there that, that if they get repeated enough, it is likely that a large portion of humanity will believe them because we, we were wired that way. If we hear something over and over enough, we tend to believe it and take it as truth, whereas it's not. So it's, um, it's more than ever, this is a time for us to come back to our own true knowing. Um, I also th say this is, so I have one of, um, some of the teams that work with me are the gurus. And so I, and I have access to, you know, the ascendant masters, gurus, and as a collective, they have declared, this is no longer the time of the guru. That time is over. At one time that was helpful for others in their um, enlightenment ascension process, but now we are meant to be our own gurus. Yes. So what I share with people are techniques and information to help people access that own highest knowing within themselves and connection, mm -hmm. direct connect. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So what is the connection then between magical soul led sensitives and that's a, such a beautiful way to put it. Instead of going, you know, you're hypersensitive. <laughs> yeah, we all know that. <laughs> We've been living like this. But I like that you say magical and soul-led sensitive. So that's so, such a beautiful description of us. And I think everybody who is watching us or listening to us right now, where's the, the crossroad, the connection between that and who we are and the trauma? Well, it's fascinating. First, so in probably in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of work done on highly sensitive people. And that term was coined, I believe, by um, uh, Elaine. Ah, I can't remember her last name right now, but she did some um, real seminal work on it. And then a lot of other people have done research. So highly sensitive people, we're talking about not just a psychological, oh, they're so sensitive to, you know, they're all about drama and this and that. No, it's our nervous systems are actually wired different than 80% of the oh, rest of the population. Really? So, and they find that this goes beyond the human race. This goes beyond, beyond people, beyond us in the human skin suits. We find it in fish 
in dogs, in cats, yes. in cows, in wolves, in birds, about 20% of their population is also wired to be highly sensitive. And then, so then you ask, well, why would anybody be wired to be highly sensitive? So a very quick answer is that it enables the herd or the group to have an early warning system. The ones that are highly sensitive are the ones that are going to be able to drink some water and know it's tainted. They're going to be able to eat a berry and go, no, don't eat that berry. You're going to get sick or die from that one. There are the ones that are going to go, there's something in the air that's not right. We need to move. We need to get out of here. We need to get out of this cave, out of this mine. There are the ones that are going to go, there's something off about this interaction going on with this other tribe. We need to really take a look and see what's happening. So the sensitives tend to be excellent counselors, mm -hmm. healers, mm -hmm. um, advisors, artists. Our nervous systems themselves are tuned in at levels of subtleties in energy so that many of us see colors even that other people don't see, or we feel energy that others, that 80% of the population may not feel or be tuned into. Um, we can walk into a room and it's like you instantly know, oh, grandpa's upset about something. Oh, grandma grandma is, um, is not having it today. Oh, mom is, you know, whatever, like we're instantly like something's up with this person, this person. And, um, and we're, we're spot on with that. We know something about the energy we're able to read it. So those are highly sensitive people. And then the magical soul led sensitives that I'm, that, you know, that's who I speak to and who I love working with. And who I am too, and you are most of this group, is we have a calling. We feel a calling. We are soul led in our lives. Mm. And so not only we have the sensitivity, that may mean that we're empaths, we may feel energy very, very um, acutely. Um, we're very sensitive, but we also have a calling. And many of us, I believe, have incarnated at this time. Um, to help bring in, usher in a new, a new time, a, you know, the golden age, the, the fifth world, the, um, the rainbow world, it's, um, there's different names for it, but a time of peace and harmony and cooperation and creativity and living in a very different way where we use our intuition more and a lot more of the feminine um, uh, attributes of receptivity are honored and utilized as wisdom. Yeah. Wow. I hope people are posting comments because <laughs> that was like an amazing takeaway. And for me, what you just said, Haumea, is freedom. Like there is an explanation and you put together many skills that may be confounding to people, but are actually gifts and explained what they are and why we have them. And I know like I resonated with everything you said, every single thing being able to, I always thought because I'm an, I was born in the year of the dog. So I thought it was one of my dog qualities that I could smell things nobody else could smell. And it's absolutely true. Something could be taken out of the fridge. My partner will go, it's fine. I smell I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no, not good. And I will obviously give it to the dogs nor to us. And we do have a dog in the household out of our three who is extremely sensitive. And I think he suffers. I think many sensitive people can physically suffer because we perceive so much, even if we're, oh, let me change that wording. Even if we're discerning enough to not take on someone else's energy, I don't know, it's, it's a fine line about walking this earth at this time with all of what's happening. And 
to not on some level energetically or otherwise take it in to your soul or body, you know, and then be able to go, what's mine? What isn't mine? What really belongs to me? How do I let go of this? So, so talk about that. Here we are, these sensitive people living in a world really not designed for us. <laughs> so can you offer us tips, sensitive tips, so we can more easily be on earth and with humanity? Yes, I can. Um, first of all, I think the awareness piece is so primary because as a sensitive, most of us inevitably say, what's wrong with me? <laughs> We're comparing ourselves to others. Others make comments to and about us, and we end up thinking there's something wrong with us when it's not. It's not what's wrong with me. It's what's wrong with with the way things are set up, they don't work for me as a sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so I actually, so that's what I teach. And I have a, I have a 13 week immersion that I run called Awakening Beyond Your Trauma, where I give a lot of tips and tricks, techniques, and understandings and understandings about what's going on and what we can do so that we can thrive as sensitives in this world that's not designed for us. And so one tip I would say is that most of us are very um, highly, our nervous system is, is on constant alert, like, because that's one of our jobs, right? To find, to, to be alert to danger, but we're on constant alert to the degree that it's like constantly triggering fight or flight as if it was life and life or death in every situation, not in actual life and death situations. So it can be a new person, you know, a new person, you know, comes up to your door and you're like, um, that you don't recognize or in, in a party that, you know, you're just feeling like all these people and feeling all this energy. And then your nervous system tells you it's a life and death situation. Um, and we're not able to function well when we're in that state, because we actually go up to our reptilian brain or our limbic brain, which is all about survival. And it's very, very narrow focus. So it's pretty much either this or that. It's like we we lose access to our executive brain where we have all this creativity and ability to see a bigger picture. And we it limits our, our experience and our choices. So one thing that we can do is help to tune up our vagus nerve. And our vagus nerve is the wandering nerve. It's the longest nerve in our body. It wanders from our brain all the way, you know, through our body, heart, all of the essential organs. And this vagus nerve, so it's informing our body and our nervous system all the time about what, you know, if this is safe or not. So if we're constantly tuned on to danger, then we can't even rest. And we may have physical conditions we can't heal from because our body isn't at rest. So one of the big, easiest things is do like a bee and hum. And humming actually humming, purring like a cat, it actually tones up our vagus nerve so that we can come back into relaxation. And one trick for humming, like, mm, is if you put your hands over your ears and hum, mm, then you can actually, it amplifies the hum in your head cavity, in your heart, and so on. And then also if you um, using the vowel vu, like if you say vu, vu, it, it goes even deeper into the body, like vu, and just continuing to say vu, vu, vu. That also helps to tone up the vagus nerve and allow us to come into more relaxed um, state of being. Amazing. So that's that's it's so easy. It doesn't cost anything. We have it right here. We, we're equipped for it already. You don't have to go out and buy something. Yes. You so know, that speaks to thing. once upon a time, I had a friend, a male friend who loved hiking. 
And he would pick these really difficult hiking routes. I was somebody who I could walk on a path and do fine. But as soon as you started throwing in the boulders and the switchbacks and like things you had to grab onto, it was a lot for me um, physically. And I was never athletically up to what he was. And what I started just organically doing is, you know, I sing and I organically would start singing um, to help me because it was sometimes it was really scary. I mean, we would go pretty high and have some auspicious things to climb. And I would joke and say, I'm a human jukebox. I seem to like I can download song after song after song and just keep singing. And it calmed me down so much that I was physically able to tackle the big things in front of me and succeed. We would always get to the top. And if, man, that felt good, like an accomplishment. But I don't know that I could have done it without the singing. The singing just, and it was just to myself. It didn't have to be anybody else heard it or he heard it, but it was huge for me to do for my soul so that my body could accomplish that level of athleticism. And I never knew what the connection was between doing that and superseding what seemed impossible physically and humming and singing. Yeah. Yeah. I saw you get that, that aha. That um, yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's beautiful that we, we do, we have a tool we can use to calm our sensitive natures and it works y'all. You don't even have to be able to sing. You can just, you know, hum, whatever. And um, yeah, it's interesting. So I, I'm so fascinated by your gifts. And I think where, where I want to go first is what, what got you here? Were you always like this, always able to talk to and see the unseen and connect with and utilize it for people? What was your journey to get here? So my journey, um, and I'll, I'll infuse some bits about sensitives and trauma in, in here also, Beautiful. is that from a very, yes, from a very young age, I was um, tuning into other other beings that other people didn't see or hear and energies. And I also felt very alone. Like I did not fit into my family. I did not fit into regular, you know, society, community, all of that. Um, in fact, I was a bit on the autistic side. My life was sort of like, it was sort of like seeing movies happening and not being able to have the same timing as others. And I was actually pretty much mute until I was 11. And um, part of that was because when I was very young, I think I would blurt out a few things. I didn't talk that much, but there were a few times where I blurted out things from my knowing place and adults would freak out. They would totally freak out. And so there was that and, and then other things and just my own childhood stuff um, where I didn't feel safe. And so I, I spoke maybe five at the most 10 words, you know, always less than two handfuls of words a day up until I was about 11. And I had a ritual at night when I was went to bed and I would just repeat the words I said that day. And then I would beat myself up going, oh, that was stupid, or I shouldn't have said that, or I should have said it differently. I mean, and that's just like that many words or less. Um, but, and, and I'm also, um, I have a hearing loss. And so I couldn't hear the whispers of other children. You know how, when you're playing, you whisper to each other. I couldn't hear them. So I couldn't play with kids that way either. So I pretty much went into my own world and it was nature, mostly nature that really mothered me and comforted me. And I found from the earliest age of having language, I could ask questions like, why do people do this? Or why is it like that? And something would answer me, whether it's a tree, the cloud, a lizard, um, something would answer me with the truth. It was, and, and I go, oh, okay. And, um, and so I was communicating with, with other beings and waters and other things from a very young age. And then when I was uh, 
early 30s, I was I was in my 33rd year. I had a major pesticide poisoning and it actually took me out. I I almost died from that. I probably did die um, from it, but um, because I've had several near deaths. um, My immune system was just wiped out as well as my brain. I lost my ability to speak, to read, to do math almost overnight. And at the time I was in the field of training and development. So I was on stages talking to large groups. And the last one I did, I was on stage. And then all of a sudden I came to, like I came, became lucid and I'm staring out at this group and I have no idea why I'm there and what's going on. So after that, it was like, and I just went downhill in my health from there too. So um, I actually went back to Hawaii to die and I ended up surviving, obviously, but during those, you know, almost 15 years, it was over a decade of just pretty much just trying to survive, being in the forest, living, you know, away from others and um, being so highly sensitive to any chemical exposures. I just had to be away from anything any hairspray, any laundry detergent, those laundry sheet things. And um, so I was in constant meditation and I actually was able to live the life of a mystic and not be bothered. And I pretty much feel like I, I removed myself from society and, and um, was communicating even more so with plants, trees, medicine, and the plants started teaching me their medicines. I could touch a plant and feel what it does. So I would know if it affects the reproductive system, the neurological system, what time of the day it did that, if it, if a plant was male or female, um, how it worked in a female body, how it worked in a male body, what season. There were so many things that they taught me And, um, so yeah, that's, (laughs) I, and then I had to, so since I was still, it was like, it was a long process of healing and trying to trying by trial and error, what works, what works. And, um, you know, working with the plants that way showed me, it was sort of like this, aha, I knew that the medicine people didn't just do trial and error. Um, and And it's like, yeah, because the plants will tell you, the plants will show you. Yeah. Wow. So that's, I want to take that class with you, talk to the plants and learn their medicine. Oh my goodness. Do you ever do that when somebody comes to you for a session? How may do you, let's say they've got a health situation, just for instance, or some kind of situation. Do you ever say, you know, this plant for you? would be very beneficial and this is how you can ingest it or imbibe it. Does that come up? Um, Yes, it used to a lot more um, than it does now. I just work with very few people doing medical intuitive work now. I used to do a lot more and with herbs. Um, But yeah, I I love that. I love being able to help direct people to what works for them individually because there's so much information out there, but it's like a shotgun approach. And it's so easy to, if you're not feeling well, as you start down that health education pathway, and then before you know it, you have a pharmacy practically in your own home and every herb and every supplement. And and, it's, and so I do like helping people to pinpoint what works best for them, what their system, you know, at this time, um, yeah requires. So thank you. So here you are living this monastic mystic life, talking to and being taught by the plants and nature. I, that just is so beautiful to me. And how did you transition out of that back into society and gain back your motor skills so that you were able to function? What was that about? Well, so I was living, um, I was back in Hawaii. I never thought I would leave there. And then suddenly 
I don't know that I've told this story before. I suddenly was getting um, like books would show up in my life, like on my doorstep. I got a book that had a map of, I think it was France in there. And and um, and then the stories that I was reading, and I was going, and I was working with sacred waters already. I think waters are so like there's so much magic in water and key to life in water. Um, and so I was starting to get this message to work with the sacred waters around the world. At that point, I couldn't even imagine leaving Hawaii. Um, couldn't imagine being around a lot of other people and transport, you know, flying on planes long distance. But I figured if I was being given that message, then I was also being given divine dispensation to be able to do that. So I ended up putting all my things in storage and then coming to the mainland, coming to California um, to see my birth dad for a little bit. And then I was going to head off to Europe. And so that's actually when I got to California, instead of heading to Europe right away, which I should have, um, <laughs> I met a man and um, it was that relationship trick God did on me. And so I ended up staying in the area where my dad was and uh, my mom had passed and, and I ended up going back into corporate, which I never thought I'd be able to do again. And as I was there, you know, using the computer again, having to learn new skills and I saw that I was able to. So, I mean, I was, so I had brain damage from the pesticide poisoning and the, I mean, there's like the IQ tests, I dropped at least 15 points and I could, I was like barely functioning. I was actually pinning notes to my shirt in case somebody found me, like where what my name was and where I lived and who to contact. It was, it was bad. Um, and I share that to give other people hope because I know so many people are having neurological things and brain fog and other things. There is hope. Our brains, when it happened to me, there wasn't even the theory of neuroplasticity. It was just pretty much, oh, you lost those, you lost that um, gray matter, you lost that white matter. It's like, you're a goner, sorry, you're never getting that back. And now we know that our brain is more plastic and we can rewire we can actually rewire. And so that's what I did apparently and um, found that I was able to be pretty high functioning. There were still certain areas I wasn't managing so great in, but there was a lot that I, that I did. So that corporate exposure gave me confidence again that, okay, I can, I can do life in, in this world. Yeah, um, so that's how I came back in. So. That's incredible because I, I I just keep thinking. So bless the man. Clearly, that didn't work out by the way you said it, but bless him because I, it sounds like the universe wanted you to stay and go to corporate merely to have that experience of upping your skills and seeing where you were at in a way you might not have had you just jumped on an airplane and gone to Europe. So there was, you know, an up leveling going on there for you to help you, you know, reassimilate. I'm proud of you for staying yes. and doing all that. And uh, you, you and I had thank talked uh, before the show, and I know you said that you were willing to gift us with a transmission today. So I would love to shift into that right now. And I'm going to turn the reins over to you Tell us whatever you want to, however you want to handle it. Um, we are yours for this transmission. So actually, there's um, part of my prayer has been, because I know I said I would, um, it's been that the transmissions come throughout the um, this talk. And so there have been transmissions that have been coming throughout this talk. Um, and the transmissions are different than the liberation clearings I do. I do... Um, I do energetic clearings that a lot of people feel viscerally at, as things clear from them. Um, and especially with, with traumas and, and other things. So the transmissions are more gentle usually and softer and, and they help to activate as well as to help you remember 
remember. And so hopefully, so people have probably received some things to help inspire them and remember, remember their own healing ability that they do have and their own superpowers and know that that's available to them. So, um, so that's been happening throughout as far as, um, I do have a gift for everyone though, that, okay. and I prayed on this one. So liberation clearings are so powerful. I'm able, so when I've been working with people over the years with my clients and with myself, mm. I had a focus on change process for, you know, over 40 years now. And yet when, when my clients or I would reach a certain point, there was usually something where there, it was like hitting a brick wall. Mm -hmm. It was like deja vu all over again, no matter how much self-growth work we've done. Um, it's like, dang, this thing again, again, it's showing up in my life again. And it was driving me crazy. So I worked on it for decades, trying to figure it out. And I realized the key for, especially for sensitive people is traumas, is these stuck energies that create that spiral or that repeating um, dynamic of, you know, it, because the energy is stuck in a certain pattern and then it calls in other energies that interact with it in certain ways. So the liberation clearings, I found over, over time, I've been able to develop them and work with my teams, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of strong energy coming in now. Um, <clears throat> so that many of these things that would have taken decades and for some people, some of them lifetimes to clear can now be cleared often in one session. And so <clears throat> in my prayers about this, I was given the go ahead to gift people, excuse me, one of my master classes that I, I've done and it's called, <clears throat> hold on a second. Yeah, and cool, because this is a perfect uh, segue for me to say something about that, the role of trauma and how Maya's liberation clearings. Here's a, this is a quote from her, which is, as a magical, soul-led, highly sensitive people, our nervous systems don't have the filters that most of the population have. If you're highly sensitive, there's ways that we tend to react and respond to traumas that are different than 80% of the population. So this is what she's addressing, the reaction, our responses, our filters, our nervous systems, okay? Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> there's a master class that I did and it's called Sensitives, Sorrow, Grief, and Loss. Now, sorrow, grief, and loss are some of the heaviest emotions that we have. And oftentimes, so, um, there, there is agenda to keep a lot of us in those heavier emotions mm -hmm. and heavier um, frequencies so that we're not able to access some of our other um, what's available to us and live and thrive well. So I did a master class and in this master class, I share a lot of very mystical stories that I've never shared publicly before. And when I was praying, I was hearing gift them this. And I really had to check because I would consider it sort of an advanced masterclass for, you know, healers, coaches, empaths, people that have been doing their work. Um, and it's sort of different than anything people may have experienced before, but I keep getting a yes, do it, have it available for people. So it's about a 90 minute masterclass that I'm gifting to people when they go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, you will be gifted this um, masterclass. And in it, there are liberation clearings. So I just say, don't be driving when you're listening, like be, create a sacred space for yourself. You're going to be, there's a lot of energy that's going to be moving and you have a chance to experience it for yourself. And um, yeah, and, and the teams and spirit, it's like, are so excited for people to receive this type and this level of clearing in their lives. Oh, makes sense during this ascension. And thank you so much for that gift. And just so I'm clear, My pleasure. they go to sacredharmony.com slash welcome. And that's where they 
they sign up for your newsletter and then they'll receive the 90 minute. Beautiful. Wow. I'm looking forward to listening to that and hearing your stories. I love that your bio says you're a storyteller. It's like, ooh, I want to sit around the fire with her. (laughs) I want to hear what she has to say. Um, Thank you, Hamea. There's, there's oh, two you're things. so welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Yeah, there's two things I'm thinking about. Um, and one was in your bio that also intrigued me. And that is that um, you talk about boldly expressing and living our unique divine design. Uh, what is that? And can you, and that a great time maybe for you to tell a story about somebody who you work with maybe that you were able to help align free up so that they could express and be live their divine design. The one, the one that's popping up top of mind right now is um, one of my clients that she actually has been participating in some of the group um, courses and immersions and she was going through a lot of of really big transition in her life and it was not easy so you know divorce and um you know threats to have the children taken away and and just you know probably with a narcissistic partner so there was a lot of ugliness and you can imagine how ramped up your nervous system would be with that and how overwhelming it would feel and through the time, the weeks together, she was able to really calm herself down, calm down the nervous system and come into a place of just calm, peace and knowing no matter what was going on outside, even though, I mean, just horror stories were happening. And yet she was able to maintain and achieve and then maintain that groundedness. Um, And then she had tools to use with it. So um, that's that's one thing that I'm say, it that I've seen recently that has helped someone that was in a very very difficult situation to really come into um, a state that she was able to feel better herself, take care of her children, and um, it is probably affecting and probably resulting in some really wonderful outcomes for the family because of it, rather than collapsing under and giving into unreasonable demands. So that's one. Another one that I would, um, that I would share is a friend has a teenage son and he was feeling he knew he's, he's a sensitive and he knew, he said, there's this pressure on my chest and I, I just, I don't feel myself and I don't feel like, like, you know, I, I'm fully alive and I can't fully do my life right now. And so a session with him was able to remove an entity and some other stuff that was going on there. And he immediately felt it lift off. And he felt like he, you know, he had his life back. He was able to come back into himself. And um, so those are a couple of examples. Um, what about cancer that's what or um, Alzheimer's? I guess there's the three biggies. They say everybody's going to, the, the percentage is ginormous. That if you're going to die, there's very few that just go in this sort of beautiful, graceful way. But the percentage, I think it's over 80%. And then that breaks down into heart, some kind of heart situation or cancer or Alzheimer's dementia. Do you help people around that at all? I do. I'm not a doctor. Right. Um, I am a health educator, health scientist by training. Um, and I and I have a holistic health practitioner certification. Um, but that's you know, I'm not a doctor. What I say is that the body knows how to heal itself if we give it what it needs and also take away any excesses um, of what is interfering with it. So detoxing, um, the vibration and the frequency of love, I'd say is the biggest thing. And those three things 
I, so I was getting clients for a while, like three cancers, three of the same types of cancers, but every one of them had a little bit different situation behind it and root cause behind it. So what I've seen, what, what I have seen is that people tend to express in one of three, you know, one of two ways, mainly it's that either heart disease way or cancer way when things are out of balance. And then we put the Alzheimer's and stuff on top of it that can affect both of those. And so it's not always that someone is experiencing a different root cause. It's usually at the root of it, it's usually some type of trauma, stuck energy, and then there can be a host of physical stuff as well. So I always bring in the physical besides just the energetic, um, but it's how we express, it can go this direction or this direction. So when we're able to clear out these traumas, clear out these other energies that are affecting us, clear out family stuff that we've carried, then the body has much more of a chance. And then also learning how to detox um, and then living cleanly, at, you know, giving our bodies what really serve, serves it, then we're in a really good position to deal with it. Um, yeah, but I'm not the person I don't advertise as the person, like if you have cancer, if you have Alzheimer's, come to me. I No, I don't, I don't do that but people do notice, oh, you know, this is clearing up. Oh, this pain is going away. Oh, this, you know, this condition is clearing up. So um, I do see that. Powerful stuff. Um, Haumea, I noticed when I was looking into you that you had offered a program and it included clutter clearings. So I want to say that again, clutter clearings to this group. And I was fascinated by that. I am not a clutter person. In fact, I, I can't, I, I, I'm actually the kind of person that I love when people come to visit because I know what little minutia is around um, is going to get cleaned up. Like I appreciate them visiting for that very reason, but I don't, I'm so sensitive that actually I can't tolerate clutter. So what is it about clutter? Cause I don't understand that. I had a mother who was definitely a clutterer. Why do people clutter? What is the pattern that run folks who choose to live amongst clutter? Well, this is a really fascinating one and it dogged me for so long, so much of my life. I mean, because personally, I've got my share of clutter, definitely what I would consider clutter, um, store things in storage and boxes and things on the floor here and there. And it's really bothered me that I haven't, here I am a master at clearing energy and yet I have clutter in my, in my home. So I started thinking about it and looking at it. And, um, and I offered this class that it just, it just ended, but we're going to offer it again um, as an evergreen. So it's the magical clutter clearings. And in Haumea style, it doesn't mean a linear, okay, we're going to learn this technique and this technique and go do this for this pile. It was very different. We did a lot of energy clearings and exercises and fun art with it mm -hmm. to look at what's going on behind it. So to your question, for many of us that do have what we would consider clutter in our lives, it's one of the last ways, one of the big ways that um, that we can be affected um, by other energies. So I found three main things. Let me see if I can remember them. One of them was that, that certain objects, items um, can take us out of the now. And actually, you know, so it takes us into a different timeline and maybe a past timeline and maybe a different um, realm. It, it, so, it, so we are disempowered in that way. Not all of our energy can be here, here and now. And so with that, I found quite a few technologies, devices, and other things affecting people so that 
they had these objects that were doing that to them and they couldn't get rid of the objects. That was also mm. something in there, you know, some spells and other things in there that couldn't get rid of them either. Um, and then there was also through some of these objects, whether it be books, paperwork, um, old family heirlooms, there were also energies and entities that were feeding on people through them. So taking our energy through them. And so there's also an agenda. They don't want us to be able to get rid of that either because it's making us disempowered and it's feeding something else. And then there was a, there's another layer of it that I is not coming to the top of mind right now too, but it was so much more than just um, you know, clearing clutter. It was, there was so much involved with it. And, um, because we are the, the people in the human, you know, experience here in the, in the physical, it's one of the ways that, um, we've been affected by other agendas that don't benefit us. And so there's that for some people, and then some of this stuff is also lineal. And then for me and many other people, we know we have a, we're like cosmic librarians. <laughs> we know at some level, we have something to share with others. That's part of our job. That's part of our sacred purpose here. And if we don't yet have the discernment of exactly what it is, we can have a sense of, I can't get rid of this because maybe it's something that I need to, you know, share with others. Um, when we do get more of a discernment around it, we can go, oh, it's those downloads and those journals that I need to share. So for instance, for me, I've got 30 years of journals that I'm starting to go through and tear out those downloads, and then I'll be disseminating those to the people they're meant to go to, you know, or to the general public. Um, so that's why I couldn't get rid of them. But that fear also drove me for many other objects, like, oh, I don't know if I can, I don't, you know, and then there's things like, but it's still useful. Many of us have parents that were war babies. And, you know, it's like going from having hardly anything not even toilet paper. It's like, I got, I have to keep, and then also you're going to get it once and it should last you a lifetime. So then it's like, you know, there's, there's this thing in you where you don't have permission to let things go because you're <laughs> supposed to make it last a lifetime. So there, there were so many different clearings in there. It was really fun and funny. A lot of times. <laughs> Amazing. I, I did that never have attributed all of that to clutter. I mean, just because feng shui people talk about it and I know the, how debilitating it is to one's being on every level, really, to live, and it depends, the modicum, right, of clutter. It can be mild and then just a little bit annoying or it could be like pretty serious. And I never realized that all of that was attributed to clutter. And I was laughing at the end when you said about, you know, buy it once and make it last because I was envisioning that's that's who Costco is made for. <laughs> All these clutter people who can go there and um, look, I'm a member of, of Costco too, but, you know, it's intense. You know, you don't just go buy a sponge. It's like you get a lifetime supply. And yeah, that is one of the Means things- for when my mom got Alzheimer's, it was incumbent on me to go in. Oh my gosh. It took, it took so many months and it was so intense. My brother and I had to hire clutter hoarding experts. I am not kidding you. I had never seen anything like this. And this was a really intelligent woman who was totally on top of everything. Like you must have a will so you don't leave people with impact or lose all your things to the government. And you must do this. She did all that stuff. She lived by her word, but whatever overtook her that over time became this and it was insane, truly, that we couldn't even find her will. Like all these important documents, nobody knew. Um, yeah. So I'm really sensitive even to the idea of clutter because firsthand I had to manage someone's 
life around that. And, and it was sad, you know, it was really sad to like, not be able to step into her place hardly and see how she was living. Um, but super interesting, even that the idea of taking you to another timeline and out of this present now reality, fascinating stuff. So I'm glad you're going to be offering clutter clearings again. And so again, people, if you want her liberation clearings, get on her newsletter, and then you will also learn about all the other courses. You've mentioned so many beautiful courses. You're going to be doing one on money coming down. Uh, there's so much that's available with you that you're gifted with, especially that you are in communication with many things that many people don't see and hear and speak to. I love that. So folks, you can go to sacredharmony.com slash welcome. And Haumea, I want to ask you here, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, thanks for asking. I I love the name of your podcast, by the way. It's so mm so beautiful and it is so liberating dare to dream so for me personally i um i did not expect to be traveling again for a while but i've been granted divine dispensation and um just got back from over a month of traveling and it looks like i'll be traveling again very soon um so i'm really looking forward to and i'm daring to create more space and spaciousness in my life and allowing myself to my to put myself as the main person in my life i my entire life has been caring for other people and servicing others and now like many of us we're being asked to really put ourselves in our own equation which a lot of us haven't done before and I am questioning almost everything that I do automatically. It's like, why am I doing that? Do I need to be doing that? Is that aligned with my divine design? Does that bring me joy? Does that, is that juicy for me? Or am I just doing it because I'm used to doing it? And so it's opening up a bigger dream for me, a bigger dream. And um, the awakening beyond your trauma immersion, which is a 13 week immersion, I really poured so much. I poured everything I had at the time into it because it's about liberating us. It's about when the people that care have are in their own power and have money, are thriving in, in this world, are living in alignment with their values, then that automatically transforms the world and so awakening beyond your trauma offers so many clearings to allow people to access and live from that place where it's their essence is their divine design and it's juicy it's magical and it's fun and it's constantly expanding thank you more please you know so <laughs> that's what i'm I'm daring to dream more people um, being serviced by that and uh, just more liberation for all of us and creating this incredible new world we're creating. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes to all of that. Thank you, Haumea Hanakahi. I love your name so much. It's musical. Thank you for coming on the show today and for gifting us with those transmissions and all of that wisdom today. Mm, thank you so much, Debbie. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you, what you're doing with this. I end today's show with this quote, embrace the beauty of your sensitivity for in its depths lie the threads that connect hearts and souls. As an empath and mystic, you possess the power to weave compassion into a tapestry of understanding to heal with a touch and to illuminate the world with your profound insight. Embrace your unique journey, for it is through your sensitivity that you'll uncover the profound mysteries of life and bring forth a symphony of love and empathy. 
Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream podcast. Leave a comment and share. I read all of them. Next week on the show is going to be the amazing Puma Freddy Quispe Singona. Puma was trained by his grandfather since the age of six, learning and mastering the Andean traditions and rituals. Puma teaches ancestral Incan wisdom with a profound respect for the global awakening consciousness. And as many of you know, I, I'm just about to graduate from a six-month shaman school experience, very intense. So I am so excited on this side of things to talk to Puma Freddy. He is here to teach the ancient teachings and the medicine of his ancestral indigenous culture. Thank you all for joining us today on Dare to Dream. What do you dare to dream?